Welcome to Black Sheep Radio. This is Nick Spiro, and I've got Cold as the other host. A.K.A. Jonathan Azaziah, Brook Norm in the building. How are we doing, people? All right. We've got a guest tonight. His name is Eric John Phelps. He's the author of the book Vatican Assassins. His website is vaticanassassins.org. Uh, the book Vatican Assassins is 1,800 pages in addition to his book. He has included 13 anti-Jesuit suppressed books that he has located over the years that are included on a CD with a grand total of about 6,000 pages. Eric has in, been interviewed several times by other talk show hosts, which is how I first got introduced to his work. He's been a guest at conventions, done, has done slideshow presentations, and without him knowing of me personally or cold, he accepted the invite to be on our show, which is truly an honor to have you here, Eric. Well, pleasure to be with you, Nick, and your listeners tonight. Excellent, excellent. And um, the first question I have, um, Eric, is the oath of the Jesuits. Is this an accurate depiction of the order? Is is this true, what they've written, that most people uh, have gotten sent to them and what they've read? Yeah, it's the oath of the fourth of hour called the extreme oath I have taken it from uh, six separate sources that I have in my book, and I use Alberto Rivera as one of the key sources, but then I go back to the Engineer Corps of Hell that was uh, published in 1883, and then that goes to um, a Frenchman's work that was released prior to that. So I quote it from, oh, several different sources of the 1800s, but the, only the top Jesuits, the high Jesuits, uh, do take that oath, according to M.F. Cusack, who was a nun in Ireland and then uh, was later saved, came to know Christ and became a Bible believer. She said that only 2% of the order actually take the oath of the fourth vow. Okay, all right. And then, um, so you would say that Alberto Rivera is a reliable source? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And um, would you explain some of the key pieces of information that Alberto Rivera exposed? Well, one of the things he exposed was the uh, Vatican quest for world government pursuant to the doctrine of the Pope's temporal power, uh, which is rarely, if ever, talked about by any priest, archbishop, bishop, etc. And that doctrine of the temporal power uh, states that the Pope has the right to rule the governments of all nations. And usually when he visits a country, he gets down on his hands and knees and kisses the ground, and that is a sign or a symbol that he has the right to rule that country. He didn't do it this time when he came to see George Bush, but when John Paul II came, he did. So they claim, it's the two keys, you know, you, you see the uh, uh, symbol on the Vatican flag, you see the triple crown, and you see the two keys. Well, the first key is this Pope's universal spiritual power which means that every human creature is to be subject to the dictates of the Pope of Rome with regard to religious issues, that there is no such thing as freedom of conscience. And then uh, the other key that was conferred to him in 756 is the key of temporal power, that he has the right to rule all governments. So this is why we understand all the priests, the bishops, the archbishops, and cardinals to be in an open conspiracy against the government's of all true nationalists for the uh, bringing in of a world government under the papacy. So you described the uh, I IHS symbol, is that what you just described? No, I described the flag that the Vatican would fly. You see the two crossed keys, and then you see the triple crown. Okay, so what is the IHS with the, it looks like a sun surrounding that with a uh, cross and then three kind of fragments coming underneath the IHS. What does that actually mean? Okay, um, as on your site, you have that there, and I have it also in my book, that um, IHS, you are told that it means by the, by the Jesuits uh, in Latin, uh, Jesus, um, oh, what is it, hominem salvador, something like that. In other words, Jesus, the Savior of mankind. What is the real meaning? But, but its real meaning is Isis, Horus, Set. It's uh, Egyptian. 
Isis Horus set. Mm -hmm. and, okay, and when you count the different points, as you look at the point uh, from off top center, the first one is the squiggly, and then you have a straight, and then the squiggly and the straight. Well, the the crooked one is a female symbol, and then the straight is male. So the Jesuit order is a perfect society in itself. That's their doctrine. They're called the Society of the Perfect, also. Okay. And with and with these points that you have on the outside, you have 32 points. By the way, if you look at the rug in the Oval Office of George Bush, there are 32 beams that proceed out of the rug, out from the center of the Great Seal that is in the center of the rug. So these 32 beams are identical with these 32 points uh, around the perimeter of the symbol IHS. Then you have the three points below the IHS. That totals 35. And then you have a final point that is the centerpiece of the cross, which touches the H. So that's, 30, that's 36 points. Now, if you add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 all the way up to 36, the total that you will get in that addition is 666. Interesting. So the IHS, which is the symbol of the Jesuit order, if you notice the cross is situated on the H. The Jesuit order is the foundational secret society that will bring to power the final Pope who will be killed, who will come back to life, and thus fulfilling the myth, the ancient myth of the resurrection of Osiris, who is killed, and he comes back to life as Horus. Right. So, right. so, so that's what they're all about. Yeah. And uh, Bill Cooper did break down the relationship between Isis, Osiris, and Horus, which I do recommend people <clears throat> listening to some of his lectures as well to understand that whole relationship and concept of the Egyptian philosophy. Mr. Phelps, I got to reiterate what my partner said, and it is an honor to have you on the show. Uh, my first question is, there's been a multitude of books that diagnose the Kennedy assassination as an attack from within our own government, but never before have there really been uh, the detail as it was in your book. Can you break down for the listeners why Kennedy was assassinated by the Jesuit order and not the United States government? Okay. Again, pleasure to be with you, and thank you for welcoming me. The, the assassination of John F. Kennedy was carried out by the Jesuit order through its control of the U.S. government. Right. It, okay, so, it, so its pinnacle, the U.S. government, being controlled by the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, as enforced by the Central Intelligence Agency, then carried out the, carried out the assassination as dictated by Cardinal Spellman, or I should say as overseen by Cardinal Spellman. It was called for by the Black Pope, uh, uh, Janssens, at the time, and uh, Pius, uh, Paul VI. And Spellman was the Archbishop of New York, right? Correct. Cardinal Spellman was the Archbishop of New York City, and so therefore he was the most powerful Archbishop in the country. The New York Archbishop is always the most powerful, because that's where the Knights of Malta are located. The center piece of operation for the Knights of Malta is in St. Patrick's Cathedral. So when you look at the characters that were involved in the assassination, you have men like um, Frank Shakespeare, who, according to one of my advisors, who was in Air Force Intelligence, considered him one of the six most educated, intelligent men he ever met. Frank Shakespeare was the, the controller of uh, CBS. We have Henry Luce, who was a Knight of Malta, a bonesman also. He Quick controlled time. Yes? You mentioned the last name Luce. I happened to have heard that name before. That was a uh, Knights Templar back when uh, um, King Lion, what was his name? Henry the Lion? 
Oh, Henry the Lionheart. Uh-huh. Is that what you mean? William the or, Lion. Wait, wait, wait. No, um, Richard the Lionheart. Okay. Uh, um, Luz happened to marry King William the Lion's daughter. Is that the same bloodline who was a Templar, I, the Luz? I, I wouldn't doubt it because all of this has to do with the royal bloodlines that they that they very covetously maintain. Okay, yeah, and um, that same bloodline is also the Bush bloodline. Mm -hmm. Right, and you can see the Bush bloodline going right back to England. In fact, you, you have a Bush house in the old city of London that Anthony Hilder reports on in one of his videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, Bill Cooper did a genealogy chart going back to King William the Lion, and um, the Bush family is... Um, tied in, that, that's their bloodline, is the Templar bloodline. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so uh, these royal bloodlines are then the leaders within these secret societies. So that would be the Knights of Malta, the Knights Templars, and thus the high-level Freemasons of today. And the Teutonic Knights, which were German, that were revived under Himmler's SS. So, so they guard their, I would say, their white Gentile bloodlines because the devil rules the world through white Gentiles. And thus these bloodlines are then secured and they're made rich and they have fortunes that they inherit and they're kept in check by these oaths of the secret societies that they're all members of. So yes, the Kennedy assassination involves several of these bloodlines. And also uh, a lot of the things that Kennedy wanted to put an end to, uh, like he wanted to destroy the CIA. We all know the famous quote where he said he wanted to scatter them to the winds and he wanted to abolish the Federal Reserve, Executive Order 11110, that made our dollars redeemable and silver again. He wanted to end Israel's nuclear program, and this was all against the plans of the Jesuit order, right? That's correct. And he also uh, was a mortal enemy of Cardinal Spellman because he would not allow Spellman to say mass in the White House. Uh, he did not invite Spellman to the White House, and he also prohibited Spellman from being involved in the CIA daily brief or one of Spellman's agents. So he cut Spellman completely out of the loop. Wow. Mm. And what is wow. Kennedy's connection to the bloodlines? Well, the, the Kennedy bloodline goes back pretty far. Um, I'm not sure exactly, you know, person to person. I can get the chart, I'm sure. But they are indeed a royal bloodline. And Irish royalty, sure, right? Sure, sure. It goes back to probably Robert the Bruce in Scotland or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's uh, basically the um, inception of when the Templars merged into the stonemasonry and created the York Rite and the um, Scottish Rite of Freemasonry? Right. You, right. you have the uh, rising of the York Rite, which was essentially Catholic, and Scottish Rite, which was supposedly Protestant. But they were both controlled by the papacy, and they were revived in the early 1700s by the Jesuits in seeking to bring back the Templars that had been suppressed by Pope Clement V in 1312. So, because they would be the warriors, the soldiers for the Jesuits in carrying out their designs. So, indeed, they revived Freemasonry in, what, 1754. They wrote the first 25 degrees of the Scottish Rite in the College of Clermont in Paris, France, in seeking to restore the Stuarts to the throne of England. So, Freemasonry was intended to be its puppet, its tentacle, but there were two great Masonic schisms that brought a portion of Freemasonry out of Jesuit control, and that Masonic first Masonic schism in the 1750s paved the way then for these high Freemasons like Chisul of, of France to call for the expulsion of the Jesuits out of France and Spain and Portugal, as well as uh, 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 refusing to align and do their bidding so the Jesuits had enemies with these high Freemasons, which they later then called the Council of Wilhelmsbad in 1782 and ultimately got it back together with the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree. But in, initially the Jesuits had every intention to use high-level Freemasonry as its stool pigeon to enforce the Pope's temporal power in the Council of Trent.
Okay, I got a good question here that um, has been really bothering me to put together these uh, puzzle pieces. In 1307, when the, Knight, the Knights Templar were sort of like suppressed and captured by the uh, King of France, and um, um, the back was the uh, Pope at the time, you said it was Clement, Clement turned the back on the Templar Knights. Mm -hmm. Um, was there really a suppression and did they really go in hiding or was there more so like an agenda to reorganize them and redirect them to do something entirely different than defending uh, Jerusalem? Well, I believe that they were really suppressed by the Pope and Philip the, Philip the Fair hated them because they were a rival to his uh, political and commercial power in France. Remember, the Templars were the big bankers of Europe, yes. not, the, not the Jews, like today. So they were a rival to, the, they became a rival to the Pope, a rival to Philip the Fair, and so they were suppressed, and they did go underground, but of course they never ceased to exist. They built Rosalind Chapel in Scotland and continued underground until the Jesuits then uh, brought them back into existence. In fact, the founding of the Jesuit order, they're really an a order of new Templars, except ten times worse. So they, they then began to uh, draw upon the suppressed Templars, as well as the Knights of Malta, because remember, the treasures of the Templars were given to the Knights of Malta. Okay. So, they were, so they were holding those treasures and keeping for them until they would be revived at a later date. Now, there was a little uh, out between the Knights of Malta and Templars at one time or another, wasn't there? Well, there was some rivalry because there were three major orders of the Crusaders that were vying for control of Jerusalem and the establishment and setting up and the ruling of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, which existed from 1099 to 1291. So there was some rivalry. There was a rivalry... Um, between the order of the uh, Holy Sepulchre. So, but the Knights of Malta was the first real crusading order that was established, and the man who established it is known as Blessed Gerard. And so all the langes or all the tongues or all the branches of the Knights of Malta that exist today can all be traced back to the Blessed Gerard, who was the assistant of King Baldwin, who was the King of Jerusalem at the time. After that, some, oh, I think 17, 18 years later, the Knights of the Temple are created, which we would call the Knights Templars. And then sometime after that, you have the Teutonic Knights, which was a strictly German crusading branch. Uh, they were created. Yeah. They were all part of the Holy Roman Empire, though, right? Yes, that's correct. The Holy Roman Empire was started with Otto in, what, 932, right around there. Charlemagne is considered the father of the Holy Roman Empire, but it really officially began about a century later. So you had the First Reich, which was the, the First Holy Roman Empire. You have the Second Reich, which was created by uh, Bismarck and Wilhelm I in 1871, which was a Protestant Reich. And then you have the Third Reich, created by Hitler and the Jesuits from, what, 33 to 45, and that was, another, that was a Catholic Reich like the first one. In fact, Hitler and Charlemagne both held the Spear of Longinus. So that was an important... Uh, a piece of information that they that they were using in their occult practices. Remember, Charlemagne sought to reduce all of Europe to the temporal power of the Pope. He baptized, he he poured water on the heads of the Saxons, calling that baptism, and told them, "You will either be baptized, or we're going to put you to the sword." So that's Charlemagne. Hitler he purges Europe of two thirds of its Jews. He kills off the vast majority of the white Protestants. Destroys Protestant cities like Rotterdam, Hull, Coventry, Magdeburg, Lubin. Uh, all these cities, and uh, and thus, and he also destroys 20 million Orthodox Christians in Russia, which are considered heretics by the Council of Trent. And the Jesuits were overseeing the Einsatzgruppens, the four Einsatzgruppens, when they went into Russia. So it was a huge, massive crusade pursuant to the Council of Trent, using their crusading orders. The SS was the revival of the Teutonic Knights. The Knights of Malta were involved in it because Franz von Papen was a Knight of Malta. He is the one most responsible for bringing Hitler to power. And then you have Knight of Malta, uh, Edwin Flynn and John J. Raskob, those two Knights of Malta bringing FDR to power. 
So the knights were busy behind the banking and behind the politics, and the uh, Teutonic knights were busy carrying out the Inquisition, and the high Freemasons were also busy doing the same because Hitler was a, a mason of a covered lodge. Eric, you mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned an interesting day, 1871. That's when Albert Pike, uh, Freemason, wrote the famous letter to Mazzini, Giuseppe Mazzini, about the documentation of the three world wars. What's the Jesuits' connection to Pike and Mazzini? Okay, the Jesuits controlled Pike and Mazzini. Uh, the Albert Pike being the most powerful Freemason in the U.S. at the time, who, by the way, was pardoned by President Johnson for high treason. Um, yeah, P uh, Pike, being the, the horrible, sinister individual that he was, was in fact a Jesuit temporal coadjutor overseeing Freemasonry and because Freemason would be the vehicle by which the black pope would rule the government, the banking, and academia, and religion of this empire. So Pike was the American, the primary Masonic Jesuit coadjutor in, in America, and Mazzini was the primary Masonic Jesuit coadjutor in Europe. In fact, Mazzini was used to, uh, to foment a revolution in Italy in 1846 or so, 40, no, 48, and the purpose of that little revolution was to drive Pius IX from his throne because Pius IX was a, considered a liberal king. He wanted to introduce a constitution into Italy. He excuse me, wanted to give the Italian people a certain amount of political freedom, and the Jesuits said, oh, no, and they punished him. So they used Mazzini to foment a revolt in Rome, and Pius IX had to flee to Gaeta, and he fled there for around 18 months. And uh, so after they used the Masons to punish the Pope, then the Pope learned his lesson. He came back, and he was an absolutist dictator till the day he died. And then, and then, uh, what would be the Vatican's purpose of the Mafia? Because we all, because the Mafia, all the Mafia is Catholic. Are, are the, mm -hmm. is the Mafia just another sect of the Jesuit order, soldiers for the Jesuit order? That's correct. Mazzini was the father of the Mafia. Right. So, so all your top Mafia dons are Masons. And uh, some are Knights of Malta. And so they're all under secret bloody oaths. And they control the criminal element of every country. Uh, the Jesuits know you're always going to have prostitution. You're going to have drug trade. You're going to have uh, all the criminal elements going on. And so therefore, they centralize its power in the mafia and take all the profits. And anybody who's not part of the loop gets prosecuted by the Justice Department or gets whacked by the Mafia. But the Mafia is the arm of the Jesuit order in their control of organized crime, which Mafia is international, even though it's centered in Sicily, and it works hand-in-hand -hand with the Black Pope's international intelligence community. And uh, my question is, the Mafia was such a powerful organization for give or take a century since its inception, why do you think their power has died down so hard? It is a ruse. It is a deception to make us think that. Remember when the big mafia dons were being prosecuted in the 70s and Rudolf Giuliani was thumping his chest and how he sent all these mafia dons to prison and so on? The mafia dons that were taken down in the 70s were all privy to the Kennedy assassination. So they were getting rid of possible testimonies, ah. like, 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 like Sam Giancana. Right. And, you know, his right-hand man shot him and killed him in his own basement. But right. they knew Giancana knew him for 30 years. Yeah, it was Rosselli. So um, they, they used their own soldiers to whack the high mafia dons or get them arrested like Carlo Gambino. But see, Carlo Gambino was against the drug trade. Right, and the mafia originally they didn't they didn't want to become part of the drug trade because they that's knew right. right. The only one was Santos Traficante, and he doesn't get touched because he's working with the mafia with the CIA to bring all the drugs in from the Golden Triangle via the Vietnam War. Right, and just so, so the, and just so all the listeners know, the the oath that ever that the. Uh, Members of the mafia take when they first learn, and that's a derivative of the Jesuit order, uh, the Jesuit oath, right? It's it's not the exact same Jesuit oath, but it is an oath that is derived from the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. 
Because okay. I have a I have a friend who is a former Gambino enforcer mm. who was in jail for what 22 years something like that. Tony Gambino he lives not far from me and he's on a witness protection program and so on. But he was the grandson of Lucky Luciano. You and mentioned the, me the, the you mentioned the golden triangle that is, and that was actually my very next question. I, th this was the first time in the history of the order that the black pope retired. Colvin Box stepped down, and this second, new second guy time. Second, second time. time. Who was the first one? Pedro Rupe, 1981. Pedro. 1981. Okay, and this cat Nicholas shows up out of nowhere, and that and he came from the Golden Triangle, right? Well, no, he was from Belgium. He was a Belgian Jesuit, and he was the vice provincial of the Middle East province, which includes Lebanon, Syria, and Egypt. So he was the master of Beirut, Damascus, and Cairo. He helped start the Lebanese War, the Lebanese Civil War in the 1970s. So he then becomes Black Pope in 1983. Wow. Why did Colvin so, Bach so, step so, down? So, 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 Colvin Bach? Okay, very good question. Before I go there, I want to add something before I forget my comment, okay? Please do. The, the Masonic Lodge of Cairo is the heart and soul of the Muslim Brotherhood. Therefore, who, therefore, whoever rules Cairo rules the mother, Muslim Brotherhood. It's the provincial of the Mideast province who is located in Beirut. He controls the Muslim Brotherhood. And that was what Kovenbach was. Okay, so now, now over to the question, why did Kovenbach step down? He stepped down, he retired, because the Jesuits are fomenting a huge war right now. And it will not be enough for one general to orchestrate it all by himself, even though he has some ten assistants. Remember, he has his assistancies, and then under each assistancy is the provincial province. The provincial governs the province, the assistant governs the assistancy, and the assistants are direct advisors to the Black Pope in Borgo Santo Spiritual Number 5 outside the Vatican. Well, this is going to be so big that I believe they're going to need two Black Popes working together to orchestrate the, what the 85 provinces that the Jesuits have so that when war begins in the Far East, in the Pacific, this is where Adolfo Nicholas comes from. He was overseeing all of Japan, all of Oceania, Indonesia, China. That was his general area of expertise. He speaks Japanese. Whereas Kovenbach, his general expertise is the Middle East, Europe, North America. So working together in coordinating this crusade, controlling both sides of the warring factions, they will then be able to bring about the desire that they want in their synthesis. Which is World War Three, right? That's right. That's correct. And, and, I, and I guess then uh, my next question would be, uh, why do you think... Israel was created, and it was the Jesuits behind the creation of Israel because that's where they want their um, centerpiece for their military operations to be. That's where the Pope is supposed to be uh, erected as the universal monarch of the world, right? That's correct. The, well, we have two factions here. We have, first of all, the Lord, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. He, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him, pursuant to Matthew 28, 18, and 19. Then we have the devil. The devil has his kingdom, of which he has de facto control. Christ has de jure control. The devil has de facto control. So there are two kingdoms and two heads of, of, uh, in these kingdoms. One is Christ. The other is the devil. The father is out of the picture because he's been propitiated with the sacrifice of Christ. So everything is between Christ and every man and Christ and the devil. Well, what's happening is the Bible is very clear that there has to be an Israel regathered from the nations with and it's been reconstituted to be reconstituted as a nation so that it can enter into the time of the 70th week of years of the prophet Daniel of Daniel 9 24 27 also this time the last three and a half years is called the great tribulation by Christ himself in Matthew 24 15 it's also called the time of Jacob's trouble pursuant to Jeremiah 30 verse 8 but, but Israel will be saved out of it 
So there's coming a time that, that the nation of Israel would be reestablished for this purpose, that it would ultimately have the, the devil would make his final attempt to destroy all the Jews, but then Messiah won't come. It will, he will return. The Jews will look upon the one whom they pierced and wheezed, pursuant to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, and realize the one they've hated for all these years is the one that's going to deliver them. Well, for that to happen, there has to be an inhabited Jerusalem with Jews. There has to be a Jerusalem with a third temple. Because a visible second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth cannot happen unless all of that is in place. So that's the biblical position, the position of Christ. Now, it's the satanic position is this, that Satan has wanted to establish his Babylonian Messiah since the very day Adam fell. That's why he erected the myth of the phoenix coming out of the ashes, the two-headed phoenix. He has two lives. One, he's, he's alive, he dies, he comes back to life. Well, this is the Antichrist. It's the same way in the Masonic Lodge. When a man is becoming a Freemason, he goes to the legend of Hiram Abiff. The Mason is killed. He's killed by the three ruffians. He has maha bone, which is a, is a word for the penis, which is whispered in his ear. And the master Mason, the, the master of the lodge, gives him the lion's paw, or the lion's grip, and he raises him back to life. Well, this is the risen pope. This is the phoenix coming back to life. It's all the same Babylonian myth of the coming Babylonian Messiah. Now, for the Babylonian Messiah to come, which I teach in my book, is the final pope that will be killed, he will come back to life. There has to be an Israel that exists. There has to be a third temple in which he will demand to be worshipped as God, and there has to be a rebuilt city of Babylon. Well, uh, this this is in the makes right now, but in the light of in what the papacy considers Israel to be, the papacy considers Israel to be the revived Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. And, there, and that revived Latin kingdom of Jerusalem can have no nationalism. It can have no autonomy of just Jewish people with Jerusalem as their capital. It has to be an international city with a host of different races and languages and religions there so that the Pope can keep it governed. Then my next question, and I don't, and I don't know the verse off the top of my head. You probably know the, you know the scripture a lot better than I do. But there's a, a verse in Revelations where it mentions the synagogue of Satan, yeah. and the reason why this is so important is because 90% of the world's Jewish population they don't even have Semitic blood in them. So well, 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 that, well, see, that's uh, I believe that's an assumption because it's clear in Deuteronomy that the Jewish race would be preserved throughout this time, that they would be the tail of all nations, and that they would be obviously identified by Gentile nations so that they would be persecuted, so that they could be persecuted. So they have not lost their racial identity, their cultural identity, their language, their circumcision, all the things that they were known for in the past in the first century. And so when you go to Revelation 2 and you read about the synagogue of Satan, it's a synagogue of Satan because it hates their own Messiah. Just like the vast majority of these churches are churches of Satan because they rejected the Bible and they reject the true Christ. So that's a spiritual issue in Revelation 2. It's not physical or genealogical. So then, and the reason why I ask is because I'm, I'm Mizraim. I'm, a, I'm of Iraqi and Moroccan Hebrew blood. And the Mizraim are treated just as bad as Palestinians in Israel by Israel's government. Eighty percent of the poverty in Israel is Mizraim. Eighty percent of the prisons are filled with Mizraim. Israel's own government perpetrated a holocaust against the Mizraim from 51 to 63 through their internment camps. Uh, there were 100,000 Mizraim that were slaughtered by Menachem Begin on orders from David Ben-Gurion over uh, nuclear weapons that they got from this country. 100,000 Mizraim. That's why I bring it up. I mean, and well, I guess I, that... I, I, go ahead. Um, okay, the, we know the Israeli government. I call them in my book the Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists. Yes. But the, but the Israeli government is just as evil and just as wicked as the Saudi government, because they're Masonic too. They're just as evil and wicked as the quote-unquote Palestinian leadership, because right. they're Masonic too. Yasser Arafat had eight audiences with the Pope. So nobody, nobody has a truly loyal leader to their own race, their own language, and their culture anywhere in the world. They're all compromised because they're all Masons subject to the Black Pope. That I and, agree with. 
So what my position is this. My position is that God gave the land of Israel to the racially Jewish people. And the, they have a right to that land. And therefore, I believe that they should be and dwell their land and that there's 22 Arab countries in the area where the Arabs can go to. But you see, that can never be resolved. The Pope will never allow in any kind of resolution between the Arabs who live in Israel and between the racial Jews there because he always benefits from the diplomacy out of them killing each other. Of course. And, and let's take another example. Back in, what, 1970 or so, 10,000 Arabs sought to leave Israel and emigrate into Jordan. And what does King Hussein do, that high-level Freemason working for the Pope? He no. kills 10,000 10, of them. Right. The Black September Massacre. So, right. so what, we are, what we hear all the time is what the, the government of Israel is doing to the Arabs in, in uh, Israel, which is bad. But there's never any resolution of the, of the uh, problem. Here's another example. You look at the Emir of Kuwait. The Emir of Kuwait, after he came back from the, from the Gulf War to Kuwait, the first thing he does is he persecutes the Arab Palestinians, beats them, and then sends them all back to Israel. So the Muslim leaders will continue to obey the Pope in keeping lots of killing and division in the kingdom of Jerusalem so that there can ultimately be foment at a war there where millions of Arabs are going to die. I agree with that, and that would probably bring me uh, to my next question before I let Nick hop back in. Uh, the Talmud is one of the more radical religious books out there. and I mean, most of it is downright evil. It's racial supremacy. I want to know what you're feeling on the book. Uh, what's the threat of Jewish Zionism? And do you believe that the Jesuit order created Zionism to destroy the real, true Semitic Hebrew people, just like they created communism to destroy the Russian Orthodox Church? <laughs> Very good question. Well, absolutely. I believe the Jesuits created the Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists from their Fabian socialists in Britain. The Fabian Socialists with George Bernard Shaw and C.D.H. Cole and the Webbs and all those evil, wicked centers who created communism in Russia, had an ingress and outgress whenever they wanted to, uh, they were the ones that were the real backing behind the Masonic Jewish Labor Zionists. We have uh, the foremost leaders like David Ben-Gurion, who was a participant in the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust, with yeah. his right-hand man, Rudolf Kastner. That's right. If, if you read the book, Perfidy. And when that came to trial, they didn't want any of that to happen because it threatened the government of David Ben-Gurion. And so what they did was, what the Jesuits did was, is they gave up Adolf Eichmann in Argentina to make David Ben-Gurion look good. Right. So, so they have erected that government in Israel. The Bible says in Isaiah 28 that they're the scornful men because they enter into this covenant with death of Daniel 9. And they most assuredly are against the true Hebrew, Israelitish Jewish people that live in that land. And they are working in conjunction with the Vatican to kill them. I, I, I agree with that. And that's why, and that's why I brought up... Um the Khazars and the Mizrahim, I mean, most of the Palestinian people, the native Palestinian people of that region, they have the true Abrahamic blood in them. I mean, they may have converted to Islam, but the blood, blood is blood. They have more Abrahamic blood in them than the people running Israel's government. And like you said, the reason why the, the Palestinians and the Hebrews continue to kill each other is because it keeps them away from what's really going on in the region. And that's where the Jesuits want to erect their new world order. That's correct. Now, I do not agree with the theory of the 13th tribe. I do not agree that the Jews in Israel today are the Khazars. I, I did a study on that of a couple of years ago and came to the conclusion after I consulted the old dictionaries of the 1800s that uh, that was a new theory that was put forward by the Jesuits in Austria about uh, the 1910s or so. Yes, that's correct. So the, the racial Jews, they have not lost their identity. 
They've maintained their identity, but uh, they are being persecuted and they will continue to be persecuted. And furthermore, they're going to be persecuted here in North America. They're going to be mass murdered here. And the Jesuits are using the nations that they're resident in, particularly here in North America, which is their last great stronghold, to kill as many of them as they can with the coming martial law we have in fascism, while driving a portion back to Israel for in their intended final annihilation as what the Vatican has promised, because as long as there are a racially Jewish people that is recognizable, that is a threat to the Vatican. All right, so that covers Zionism. What about the Talmud? What do you think of the Talmud? Well, the Talmud is a very evil document. I think it's somewhat 60 volumes. It was first codified in, in the, what, the 5th century or put together, but it wasn't printed until what, the 15th century. I believe that the Talmud was put together by Jews serving the papacy, aided and embedded by certain priests, because the parallels between the Talmud and canon law are very much identical. So, so the doctrines that you will find in the Talmud uh, is really a Vatican supremacy that they're preaching. The hate that you find there is reflected in the canon law. And when the Talmud comes out and calls Jesus Christ a bastard and his mother a whore, and that Christ is boiling in hot fecal material in hell at this moment, then that, we know that's an evil, wicked document, but it's also intended to create hatred for the average Jew who knows nothing of the Talmud, because the right. Talmud is a document unique only to the Orthodox Jews, which is a vast major minority of the racially Jewish Hebrew people. That cop in, man. All right. Um, Eric, in a past interview of yours that I listened to, you mentioned Dr. John Coleman. Um, I read his book, and it goes into depth about the Committee of 300, and I listened to his lecture. I understand that he was a former MI6 British intelligence agent. Um, is most of his information valid? I think a lot of it is. But what uh, Clued, I mean, he even said uh, Redinger, who was one of the founders of the Bilderbergers, Bilderberg Group was a Jesuit and a high Freemason, which was a, a very good piece of information. It got elsewhere also. But what he does is he's obviously a Roman Catholic, and he defends the historic, the oldest Knights of Malta, St. John of Jerusalem, and he distinguishes those Knights of Malta from the British branch and says the British branch is evil, but the old branch is good. And that's absolutely wrong. All the Knights of Malta are tied together in the Vatican, regardless if it's a Protestant branch, an Orthodox branch, the Orthodox branch that, that Glenn Horowitz joined. And that we've had a little go around about that because he should not have anything to do with any branch of the Knights of Malta because they're all tied together in the Vatican. Glenn Horowitz. Didn't he mm -hmm. print several books about like the conspiracy on AIDS and things like that? That's right. It's an excellent book. And he, even, he goes after the Knights of Malta in that book, uh, Emerging Viruses, AIDS and Ebola. But then yeah. he goes and he joins the Knights of Malta of the Russian tongue, of the Russian lange. Well, I show in my book that the Russian lange was working in conjunction with the American tongue of the Knights of Malta uh, during the Cold War. And that wow. the, Grace Russian, the Grace Russian Company was working together during the Bolshevik Revolution. Because the Jesuits were uh, turned over to the uh, to the secret societies. Sure seems that way, and you have the same thing with Sean David Morton. Sean David Morton's a knight of Malta, and he's a great friend with George Norrie, who was trained by Jesuits at the University of Detroit Mercy. That's why those guys won't entertain this topic on their show. Right, right. And then, as far as Carol Quigley goes, he was a member of the CFR, a professor at Georgetown. He awarded Bill Clinton with becoming a Rhodes Scholar. What does it mean to be a Rhodes Scholar? Well, as a Rhodes Scholar, you're going to England and you're studying at Oxford and you're being groomed to, to participate in the world government that the Jesuits have established. Now, we must remember that Cecil Rhodes was a high-level 33rd degree Freemason along with Lord Milner, Alfred Milner. And uh, Cecil Rhodes is quoted as saying that he was the Jesuit general of the Round Table and that he patterned the round table after the Jesuit order. Cecil so Rhodes is the one that founded the diamond mines in Africa. He's the one that started the diamond trade in Africa, he, right? He stole them. He stole, stole them, them. From, the, from the Protestant white Boers in, in the Second Boer War. 
That's when they destroyed the Transvaal. They destroyed the Orange Free State. They stole. They killed over 100,000 Boers. They killed 30,000 women and children in concentration camps. It was a savage murder of historic white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in South Africa, in Southern Africa. When they destroyed the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, then they created South Africa, and that's when Rhodes stole the diamond mines. And then turned them over to the Oppenheimers, however many years later. Yeah, well, the Oppenheimers are, 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 are Jews working for the Pope, and Knights of Malta, I have some documentation, that the Knights of Malta run the De Beers. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And the Knights of Malta that, run um, Goldman Sachs, yeah. 80 to 90 percent of all the natural resources um, that are being extracted from Africa are owned by British uh, business elitists, from what I read. They, they're owned by the cartel capitalist, high knights of Malta, and high Freemasons who are subject to the Pope of Rome as well as the Queen of England. Remember, the master of the Queen of England is the Archbishop of London, the Archbishop of Westminster. The master of the Archbishop of Westminster is the Jesuit provincial there in London. So she curtsies to the Jesuit provincial and the Archbishop. And so uh, she's a Dame of Malta also. I have a picture in my slide presentation of her. So she is completely in the hands of the Pope, and thus all the big cartel capitalists, and I'm not against capitalism, I'm against cartel capitalism, all the cartel capitalists in England are knights subject to the Vatican by way of the Queen. So how did Bill Clinton um, come to power when in his college years he was the stereotypical hippie, barely showered, shaved, slept outside, long-haired party animal. How did he become, you know, a powerful uh, figure in, in society? Well, according to Sherman Skolnick, uh, Bill Clinton is really a Kennedy, I believe, a Kennedy or a Rockefeller. So he is part of a royal bloodline. So, so they brought him, they had made him a Rhodes Scholar, they, they gave him his education at Georgetown. He was the most popular student at Georgetown when he was a senior class president, the closest to the Jesuit order. He was a personal friend of Richard McSorley. Richard McSorley was the confessor to Jackie after Kennedy was assassinated. Richard McSorley met with Clinton in Oslo, Norway with his anti-war propaganda campaign. So. Clinton was completely in the hands of Timothy Healy, the head of uh, Georgetown University. In fact, I, there's a picture at Georgetown of Clinton kneeling at the grave of Timothy Healy, and behind him is standing Leo J. O'Donovan, who was then the president of Georgetown, and I wanted that picture for my book. And that secretary there, the black secretary that was working in the president's office, said, no way. You know, what do you want that picture for? Blah, blah, blah. And she kicked me out of the office. So, so, so they don't want that connection of the Jesuits being that obvious to Bill Clinton. Right, right. Now, as far as Carol Quigley goes, um, would you say that he was a whistleblower and kind of helped out the average person to realize – the agendas? No. I regard Carol Quigley as a traitor. Carol Quigley was the deep personal friend of Jesuit Edmund Walsh. Jesuit Edmund Walsh was the most powerful Jesuit in America from about 1919 to 1956 when he died. Edmund Walsh was the founder of the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, which is really nothing more than a diplomatic corps to implement the foreign policy of the Jesuits towards their world government out of Jerusalem. Jesuit Edmund Walsh was, the, uh, was there at Versailles to make sure that Germany was blamed for World War I unrighteously so that would guarantee war in 20 years. Edmund Walsh was in Bolshevik Russia, and I have a picture of him in my book speaking with Gregory Zinoviev, who was one of the top four Bolshevik Jews there in Russia. And when, when Walsh was there under the guise of bringing food and aid to the suffering Russian people with the Papal Relief Fund and then the American Relief that gave $70 million to the Bolsheviks, Meanwhile, George, uh, Edmund Walsh was setting things in order in 1922. He was there for almost two years. He made Joseph Stalin the secretary of the Communist Party, who was a Gentile, trained by Jesuits disguised as Orthodox priests and tiplists. 
And so the Walsh set up the Bolshevik government, and it was also the Jesuits who were involved in changing from the Julian calendar to the Jesuit Gregorian calendar in Russia, because it was a Jesuit, Christopher Clavius, who set up the Gregorian calendar. And then he brings in, then the Edmund Walsh is right there in the Congress pushing FDR and encouraging FDR to extend lend lease to Russia, to Stalin's Russia. That gave them $11.3 billion worth of infrastructure and army material. Further, Jesuit Edmund Walsh was with FDR in the White House when in 1933, very shortly after he took office, one of the first things he did was recognize Soviet Russia, so all of the Pope's uh, manufacturers and, and major industries on Wall Street could extend credit and loans and build Soviet Russia. So Walsh was the mag man behind it. Walsh was the master of FDR. And so as we look at the power of the Jesuits at Georgetown, we see that Carol Quigley was part of that. He got a $1,500 loan from Edmund Walsh. He fawned over Edmund Walsh. And in his book, Tragedy and Hope, he only mentions the Jesuit order one time on one page. Other than that, he blames it all on the Anglo-American conspiracy, which is true. The Jesuits have hijacked the British government since King George III, and they've hijacked our government since they assassinated Lincoln. But it doesn't end merely with the Anglo-British uh, royal families and empires because the Jesuits control us. Okay, so his uh, book, Tragedy and Hope, um, would be really uh, something to not even really study. No, you want to study it. No, you want to study it, and you want to see all the Anglo connections. Who are these Englishmen and American royal families in charge? But you want to take it one more step and show that they are, these men are either high-level Freemasons or Knights of Malta, subject to the Jesuits. Well, this is why you're on the show, Eric, is because um, a lot of uh, people who are talk show hosts or who are authors of books don't cover the Jesuit, the Knights of Malta. They only scratch the surface of what is the most obvious of what people can see just before their eyes anyway. So um, it's, it's good that you're clarifying this. And I do recommend other works, you know, like the Birch Society. They put out some very good things, but it all, always goes to blaming the Jews, blaming the Rothschilds. Well, they look favorably on Pedro Rupi, and like Gary Allen's None Dare Call Conspiracy. He, he quotes Pedro Rupi as an enemy of uh, this world conspiracy. So the Birch Society, even though on a low level, does some right fact accounting, like Stormer's None Dare Call It Treason. In the end, when it comes to who done it or who's in charge, they never go to the Vatican or the Jesuit order. You're speaking of the, uh, speaking of the Rothschilds, you mentioned um, uh, Evelyn Rothschild is rumored to be the richest man in the world. They, a lot of people say that he possesses half of the world's wealth at an estimated uh, half a trillion dollars, and the Queen of England is rumored to be astronomically wealthy. Where does uh, the Jesuit That's order stack up into the world's wealth? The Jesuit order rules the world's wealth because it controls all the bankers. And the, ma the primary bankers are white and Gentiles. The subordinate bankers are Jews, like the Rothschilds, the Sassoons, the Schiffs, and so on. We never hear of the bankers like Felix Larkin, like uh, a few others that are, that are Montague Norman, uh, Heimar Schock during World War II. They're all white and all Gentiles and much more wealthy than the Rothschilds. So these white Gentiles who are Knights of Malta and high-level Freemasons are the most powerful bankers because, according to Luke 21, 24, we're living in the times of the Gentiles. And Jerusalem would be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, that's when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and he establishes the Davidic kingdom in power that he first sought to establish when he came the first time. So as long as we're under the times of the Gentiles, Gentiles will control the banking, they will control academia, they will control the politics, they will control the religion and, until the Lord returns. And the Jews involved are nothing more than the Pope's court Jews. Okay, I, I do understand that the Knights Templars were the originators of central banking, international banking, mm -hmm. and that um, they did place Jewish figureheads in the role to um, keep 
that solidified and keep it running while they were, um, you know, continuously um, being pirates and confiscating other boats and expanding their empire. Is that correct? Right. Right, and also to keep it look like it's the Jews running the finances. That's why the Jesuits in control of their Federal Reserve Bank always have a Jew that's the head of the Federal Reserve Board. But they never tell you about the heads of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, like William J. McDonough, who was an Irish Catholic, a Knight of Malta, and a member of the CFR, because that's the bank where they hold all their gold bars. There are in excess of 600,000 gold bars there that they've swindled us and all the other nations out of. So they always keep a front Jew in your face like they do in Hollywood. Well, at the same time, in the back, they're running things. They do the same thing with the mafia. They have Meyer Lansky up front. It looks like, according to Michael Collins Piper and all these other guys, why, well, it's the Jews that run the mafia, but it's not the case. They are merely bookkeepers, and those that are running the mafia are Gentiles. Now, the creation of Switzerland, I mean, right there in front of our face, you see the Templar flag, um, yeah. and yeah. that's the headquarters for international banking, would you say? That's correct. The Switzerland, in its inception at the time of the Reformation, was known as the Thermopylae of Europe. Switzerland was the first place to experience, actually Geneva was the first place to experience true national independence because of Calvin and the other reformers that were there. When God intervened to break the temporal power of the Pope there. But over time, Switzerland became compromised in 1847-48. Switzerland expelled the Jesuits, and the Jesuits fomented a civil war in Switzerland. And sometime after that, they took control of the Swiss government and made a new seal for the, what, the city of Geneva, where you see the Jesuit uh, sunburst, and you see uh, another symbol that's, that's very much Jesuit or Masonic. So yes, Switzerland today, and has been since probably the turn of the 19th century, the banking haven for the Vatican. And um, why is it that they're always considered neutral during world wars? Is it to keep that uh, intact without having any damage done to it? That's right, to keep it from being invaded. And that's where lots of the Pope's gold, when he stole it out of Europe from the Jews and from the Orthodox and from the Protestants, much of that gold wound up in Swiss banks. Vatican rat lines, right? That's correct. The Vatican rat lines, which one author calls it Odessa, but it's really the Vatican rat lines overseen by the Jesuits. In fact, there's a book written in German called um, Flight from Nuremberg. And in that book, the author, Werner Brockdorf, uh, tells us that it was the Jesuits who were working the Brenner Pass to bring in the high Nazi officers out of Austria, out of what would be then Eastern Europe, down through the Brenner Pass into Italy, and then to be sent to Egypt and Syria and U.S. and South America. But the Jesuits oversaw it all through Bishop Udall. And Bishop Udall was a Knight of Malta. What's the difference it's, between a Knight of Malta and a Knight of Columbus? Knight of Columbus, they were started in 1882. And their headquarters is in New Haven. And it's very intriguing that the Jesuits would establish their Knights of Columbus in New Haven, which was also the headquarters for Skull and Bones prior to that at Yale. So the Knights of Columbus are merely the hatchet men. They're the soldiers for the Jesuit order. They're the ones, the men of the fourth vow, are willing to carry out the Jesuit oath to kill whoever the Jesuits determine they want to have killed. Now, the Skull and Bones uh, uh, organization, the Brotherhood, um, they tend to feel that that's a, an extension off the Templars based off of um, the Skull and Bones that they used to fly on their flag while they were in wartime. Is mm -hmm. there a connection? Well, well, no no doubt uh, they were an extension of the Templars and also an extension of the Bavarian Illuminati. The Skull and Bones initiation, according to Victoria Roberts, Robbins, is that uh, during that initiation, they have to, each one of them has to kiss the slippered toe of the Pope. <laughs> and they are pronounced Knights of Eulogia, which means Eucharist. They're pronounced Knights of Eulogia after the initiation. So they're really, and they're, the ones that pronounces them that is Don Quixote. 
Well, if you read Cervantes' work, uh, you'll see that it's a satire in the Jesuit order that Don Quixote is really nothing more than Ignatius Loyola because he wants to send off Jerusalem and take Jerusalem from the Muslims, which is exactly what Loyola sought to do. So the Don Quixote and the Bones initiation is the Jesuit general. They're kissing the slipper toe of the Pope. All shows that their loyalty lies completely with the Vatican. Speaking of Jews and Muslims again, my question is, and I've, and I've looked high and low, and I can't seem to find a connection. Theodore Herzl, most people call him the godfather of uh, modern political Zionism, 1896. Was there a Jesuit and a Knight of Malta connection with him? Yes. Um, there, the reason Theodore Herzl started his Zionist movement, his labor Zionist movement, because remember, the labor Zionists have killed off all the revisionist Zionists. Right. They killed, off, they killed them off because the revisionist Zionists were true Jews who wanted to have their own nation. And so they killed off uh, uh, the lone wolf, uh, Jabotinsky, and all the other followers. But the Jesuits' labor Zionist movement was started by Theodore Herzl because of the Dreyfus Affair. If there was no Dreyfus Affair, there is no labor Zionist movement. And the Jesuits were behind the Dreyfus Affair. They were the ones that controlled Esther Hazy, who was the real traitor, and they blamed Captain Alfred Dreyfus for passing French military secrets to the Germans, which was all a lie. They imprisoned him for, what, some eight or ten years at Devil's Island, and uh, ult ultimately he was released and vindicated. But the Jesuits were behind this, the Assumptionists, which is nothing more than a, a continuation of the Jesuit order. They controlled the press in Paris, and they're the ones that were hyping it with all the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. Meanwhile, the protocols of the elders of Zion is, had been completed in France, written by the Jesuits, so that they could blame, ultimately, the Bolshevik Revolution on the Jews. Right. So it was, it was an anti-Jewish movement in France set in motion by the Jesuits because the Jesuits had been expelled from France by Gambetta in 1880, and so they had a score to settle with the French government, and they then excited this, and then as a result of this, Theodore Herzl, who is in cahoots with the Jesuits by way of the Rothschilds, he goes to visit the Pope, and he has an audience with the Pope in 1904. Now, anybody that has an audience with a pope is a traitor to his own people. That includes Martin Lucifer King. That includes Yasser Arafat. That includes Ronald Reagan. All of them, when they go kowtow to the pope, they're betraying their own nation and their own people. Theodore Herzl did that in 1904. You mentioned Martin Luther King, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I understand that he was also a member of the Brotherhood. He was a, a high-level Mason. I believe he was. There is nothing, I have no documentation where I can prove it, but I believe he was because uh, he, is, he is overseen by A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph was the black mover and shaker of the Jesuit Order's civil rights movement. And the man who controlled A. Philip Randolph was the Jesuit... Um, uh, John Lafarge. John Lafarge was really the master in the beginning of the civil rights movement, not for the benefit of the blacks or the whites, but for the benefit of the Jesuit order. And John Lafarge was the right-hand advisor of Spellman, and he was the one responsible for getting Spellman in the NAACP, which was financed by Rockefeller. Right. So, the Je so the Jesuits controlled A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph controlled King. When King became disobedient, by calling for, an, for calling for an end of Cardinal Spellman's war in Vietnam, that's when they killed him. Correct, correct. And I understand the Black Secret Society is called the Bole. Have you heard that? The term? Bole Society. I have it from my website. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Why was Malcolm X murdered? Malcolm X was murdered because because he was a real man, and because he told the truth when he found out that the Ku Klux Klan and the Nation of Islam have the same paymasters. Right, and when he and when he said that publicly, that was the beginning of the end for him. Right. Then and Farrakhan he, facilitated it, no? That's correct. The Farrakhan had a hand in the assassination, for which he recently apologized to Malcolm X's daughter, publicly, on wow. TV. So, I mean, he didn't come out and say he did it because you know murder. There's no uh, there's no uh, statute of limitations. He could be tried for that. But he came out and said, if I had anything to do with it, please forgive me. He knows very well he had a part in it, just like Wallace the son of Elijah, the false prophet. 
So, and furthermore, uh, Malcolm X then got on this Freemasonry about the Masons control, controlling the nation of Islam. Because he knew the Ku Klux Klan was Masonic. The Ku Klux Klan used to attend NOI meetings. And that made Malcolm angry because his father was killed by Ku Klux Klansmen. Right. So, when, so when he saw the absolute duplicity of Elijah Muhammad, the false prophet, the dishonorable Elijah Muhammad, he quit. And he came out and told the truth. Wallace Muhammad told Malcolm that Elijah Muhammad had fathered, what, eight girls from, from four teenage, young teenage black girls. And when he made this public, that just, that did it for him. So you have the Nation of Islam furious with him that's run by the, the FBI informant, the Freemason, Elijah Muhammad, and also his son, Wallace. You have the FBI mad at Malcolm X because uh, the third in command of the FBI was Carthage Deloach, who was a Knight of Malta, and he still lives, by the way. And you have... Uh, and Hoover CIA. hated him too, right? And Hoover, Hoover was a Knight of Malta. Hoover was a 33rd degree Freemason. Some sources say a Knight of Malta could very well be, but I know he was a 33rd degree Freemason. And he was also sitting on the order of the 33rd degree in Washington, D.C. Hmm. So Hoover was in on it too. So what happened was, and I tell this in my book, is that when it came the time to, to uh, shoot Malcolm at uh, Audubon Ballroom, the New York police was controlled by Spellman. Right. So they stood down. They didn't protect him. The FBI and the Nation of Islam worked together, according to Betty, Malcolm's wife. So they all worked together to whack, uh, to kill, to murder Malcolm X, covered it up, never did a, a thorough investigation on that, and nope. then blamed it, and blamed it on the Nation of Islam entirely. I have a question regarding another assassination that occurred recently, last year, at the end of the year, Benazir Bhutto. Was there any Jesuit connection to her? Oh, sure. Benazir Bhutto was supposed to give information to Arlen Specter. Arlen the, Masonic, Specter the, the Masonic Jew that was involved with Kennedy's assassination. That's right. 33rd degree Jewish Freemason, still a senator of my state, the name of Christ. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, he was involved, and then... Um, then Benazir Bhutto said that uh, Bin Laden had been killed several years ago by the man who was threatening her life. Well, I we know, can't she did let... it on the interview with Frost. I saw that. Right, with yeah. Frost. So we can't let that out of the basket, can we? We, no, have to we, keep this, we? we have to keep this fraud that we're after Bin Laden alive to justify this papal crusade. So she did two things. She was going to be very effectual in not bringing Pakistan into this crusade to truly go after that any Muslims that were involved in quote unquote Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. and so she was a threat to the power of the Jesuit order in continuing this crusade. So they killed her. No, no and of course it was the Pakistani ISI that oversaw it all. Right, and the ISI takes their orders from the CIA, and the CIA right. takes their orders from the Jesuit order. That's right. And D. Chardin, Teilhard D. Chardin was a foremost Jesuit in the 1950s and 19, late 1940s who was working for the Office of Naval Intelligence as well as the CIA under Knight of Malta while Bill Donovan, who had John Birch murdered by Mao Zedong so they could put Mao Zedong in office as the, as the chief inquisitor in China. I like I like for you to make it clear to all the listeners because there's only there's only two um, perspectives that we get on 9/11 that the U.S. government did it or the Israeli government did it. But I know you mentioned in your book that Kovenbach was the one that ordered the attack. Could you explain to the listeners what the Jesuits' connection to 9/11 was? Okay. The Jesuits have been planning a war with Islam for at least a hundred years. And this is their crusade to kill off primarily the Shia. Because the Shia, the leadership, the, the high inman of the Shia is regarded as infallible and divine. Mm -hmm. unlike, unlike the Sunnis. The leaders of the Sunni is considered merely a temporal prince. So there can only be one man in the earth that's regarded as infallible and divine. And that's the Pope. And that's the Pope. So anybody that threatens that position has to be removed. That's why they would not allow Japan to surrender. 
they, de they demanded unconditional surrender to humiliate the emperor and that he would no longer be regarded as divine by the Japanese people. That's why they captured the Dalai Lama in 1959, took him out of uh, Tibet, because there can be no leader of the Buddhists who's regarded as divine, because he can't be, because he's been captured, he's been taken out by the CIA. So the same thing has to happen to the Shia. The Shia are going to be mass murdered, as they are now being murdered in Iraq. As that's they are why now they're planning the war with Iran, because Iran is predominantly Shia. That's correct. That's why the war has to go into Iran. And so once the Shia are mass murdered to the desire of the Jesuit order, then they are going to use the Sunnis in conjunction with the Chinese and the Soviets for a Sino-Soviet Muslim invasion into the United States after they have used the military of the U.S. for its purposes in the Far East and in the Middle East. So we can want to go back to 9-11. How do we put all of this crusade into motion? The same way we did it at Pearl Harbor. We're going to have the Japanese emperor and, and, and FDR, these two high-level Freemasons, work together under the control of the Jesuits to then bring about the Pearl Harbor incident to then justify war and the declaration of war against the Japanese people. So that's what they've done with 9-11. They have the Saudi king, who is a high-level Freemason, and the Bush dynasty, which is Masonic, as well as Knight of Malta, because George Herbert Walker's brother, Prescott Bush Jr., is a Knight of Malta. Wow. So, so they're working to, and remember, Jeb's in the four, uh, fourth degree Knight of Columbus. So you have the Knights of Columbus, Skull and Bones, Knights of Malta, high-level Freemasonry, all consolidated in the Bush family alone. Right. So, so they therefore, they therefore, having George Bush as president, they used uh, Edward. Remember the Jesuits. Where the Jesuits always have a major university uh, adjacent to a powerful archbishop. We see this in Munich. We see it in Paris. We see it in London, and we see it in New York. Yep. In New York, the Archbishop of New York, being Edward Cardinal Egan, a Knight of Malta, the head of the. The, the, all three tongues of the Knights of Malta in the United States, because there's three branches of the, of the tongue here. He was given the order and overseen by the Jesuits of Fordham University, men like Avery Cardinal Dulles, mm -hmm. who, who is the son of John Foster Dulles, who was a Knight of Malta and the pen holder of President Eisenhower who is the nephew of Alan Dulles, who was also a Knight of Malta and the former head of the CIA. This very same Avery Cardinal Dulles, a Jesuit and a Knight of Malta, oversaw Cardinal Egan in the, in the conspiracy to bring down the World Trade Center and to blow up the part of the Pentagon. And the man that Cardinal Egan used as the centerpiece for this was one of his favorite Knights of Malta, the director of Central Intelligence Agency at the time, on the, on the Council of National Security Council, George J. Tennant. G George J. Tennant was educated by the Jesuits at Georgetown. He went to their School of Foreign Service. He was absolutely the key figure in this. And what did they do for him? They let him retire, and they gave him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Right. So, so once they did this, and they brought down the World Trade Center, and the World Trade Center was built to be destroyed, just like the Titanic was built to be sunk. They didn't weld any of the X-bracing in the, in the World Trade Center, and I was told that by a Boston architect who was part of a designer of the World Trade Center. And they couldn't figure out why they were bolting the X-braces and not welding them. So it was designed to bring down, and when they brought it down, they immediately have their Oswald, where they can blame him, Osama bin Laden, and then justify this crusade. And when they launched their crusade into Afghanistan, they launched that crusade on October 7th, 2001. And when they, that October 7th is a very key day because that's the very same day, October 7th, that the Holy Roman Empire launched its war, its greatest naval sea battle against the Muslims, against Suleiman the Magnificent, in, in uh, 15, I think it was 1591 or 1571, I have it in my slide projection, but it was October 7th. Hmm. So, it, so it's a crusade, just like the Battle of Lepanto, and the Knights won that crusade, so the Knights are going to win this one too. 
and they will sacrifice every man, woman, and child in this country. They will spend every penny that we have for the securing of their Latin kingdom of Jerusalem to the detriment of the Jews who live there, as well as for the urban renewal that they are putting Iraq through so they can rebuild Babylon. And the beginning of the rebuilding of Babylon is the building of Dubai. And that's why Dubai has become such a center for financial power. Correct. And that's why the Knights have moved all their infrastructure into Europe and into Dubai. As you know, Halliburton moved from Houston to Dubai just last year. Right. Mm -hmm. What about the um, uh, one, one project that's commonly stated amongst everybody involved in the 9-11 troop movement is the project for the new American century, where most of the people that are in Bush's government now were part of this project and they talked about they needed a new Pearl Harbor. Was there a Jesuit connection there, too? Absolutely. The Jesuits run the project for the New American Century through the Council on Foreign Relations, and also through the, um, oh, that, that conservative group, oh, what's it called? I can't remember, but you have all these pseudo-Christian conservatives that are a member of it. ACLU? Um, oh, what is it? It's, it's, a, it's like a, not ACLU, it's another one. Um, it's a oh, conservative think tank, right? It's a conservative think tank. I mean, that, that includes Heritage Foundation. It's all remember the Knights of Malta and Opus Dei. But yes, they have their, they have their, uh, the nine, they had their new Pearl Harbor in 9/11. That's where their Reichstag fire. They just like the Reichstag fire. They blame the communists. So now they're going to, since there's no more communist threat, quote unquote, they're going to blame the Muslims, or they blame the, the, the quote-unquote these Saudis, which I find so contradictory because this, without Saudi Arabia, there is no crusade into Iraq. Right. Without, without the Wahhabis, which are Sunnis really, there is no ongoing crusade. So it's in the best interest of the Wahhabis there who hate the Shia and regard them as heretics to continue this crusade to kill off their rivals just as the Jesuits killed off all the Protestants to consolidate all power in the Roman Catholicism and the papacy. What would you say the most uh, powerful intelligence uh, agency is in the world, Eric? Well, I would say that the, um, the Vatican is a very powerful intelligence agency, but it's just a coordinating agency. As far as carrying out the hits, the assassinations, the enforcement, I would have to say most assuredly it's the CIA uh, working in conjunction with the NSA. Uh, that would be the most powerful in conjunction with British intelligence because those three agencies control all of Soviet intelligence, all the Far East intelligence, all Israeli intelligence. So it would, it's an historic... Uh, Anglo-American uh, uh, countries that the Jesuits have controlled, at least uh, in England, for the last 200 years and for this country in the last 100 years. So what is the NRO then? National Recognizance or Organization? I heard that that was actually above the NSA, but it's never that could, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure much about that, but I'm sure that the Jesuits have their agencies that are high, like... Uh, what was that, Maj Majesty 12 and others. So, but whatever it is, they control it because the Jesuits are the master intelligence gatherers and they were that way as early as 1844 when Eugene Sue wrote his Wandering Jew and he has that tremendous section in there on Jesuit intelligence, how they keep intelligence on everybody. What is the Jason Society? The Jason Society, I believe, has to do with... Uh, uh, the pilgrims also, and the circle in Europe. So it is the it is a, a high noble blood society where you do find the crusading orders in it too. Okay, because Bill Cooper mentions them as being the elite of the elite. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. But again, Jason Society or the pilgrims or whatever you would want to call them, you will find your high knights of Malta and your high level Freemasons and your Jesuits. There is no intelligence agency in the world, no high banking people in the world, no high military in the world that is not totally controlled from the Vatican through the Knights of Malta or high level Freemasonry, which really is directly answerable to the Black Pope. So how does Islam come into the globalist plan? Islam comes into the plan because Islam was the creation of the Vatican in 610. Okay, the papacy... 
Okay. The papacy created Islam to be the sword of the church. That's why Islam killed off the, uh, the racial Jews in Arabia and in North Africa. And that's why Islam killed off the true Bible-believing Christians in Arabia and North Africa, spreading all the way into Spain, where the Muslims or Islam was used then to neutralize the Visigoths who in Spain and in southern France who denied Rome's pagan trinity. So wherever Islam raises its bloody sword, the Vatican benefits. Now, there was a time when Islam was uh, out of sorts for the papacy because when Islam took Jerusalem from the Byzantine Empire, um, the, it, uh, it refused to give it to the Pope, and that was the deal. The Pope financed the jihads in North Africa, and the deal was to give Jerusalem to the Pope when they were done. They refused. They called the Pope an infidel, praise God. And uh, for several centuries, Islam was at war with the papacy because, because Islam refused to give Jerusalem to the Pope. The Pope launches his crusades. So when Islam was finally subjugated, which I believe happened in the probably the no later than the 16th century in the 1500s, the Jesuits then in the 1700s raised up the Wahhabis, and the Wahhabis were given Arabia, which means they were given Mecca and Medina through the Saud dynasty. So now Arabia became Saudi Arabia. And it's the Saudis that are working with the Vatican, and they will contribute in the destruction of Mecca and Medina in this crusade. Just as the, it was an inside job here in the U.S. with 9-11, it will be an inside job in Saudi Arabia, and the American people will be blamed for the bringing down of those two mosques. And the Muslims that I've talked to told me, if that ever happens, Eric, it will be war against every American for as long as they live. And that's exactly so, what Rome wants. So Muhammad was an agent of the Vatican? That's correct. He was raised up by the papacy. He was taught to adore the Virgin Mary. He was taught hatred for the Jews. And he was also tutored, according to Rivera, by Augustinian monks. And it's interesting that during the Muslims' attack in the North Africa, they never destroyed any of the Augustinian monasteries. Yeah, that is interesting. I understand that Martin Luther was a member of the Brotherhood and in depth of the occult. Was the Protestant Reformation an extension of the Holy Roman Empire? No. No, the Protestant Reformation was a movement of God to get the Bible into the hands of the common man in the common language. So that is a lie. Luther was not a Rosicrucian. He was not a member of the Brotherhood. Uh, Luther did not uh, uh, write on the Jews and their lies. I've covered that in a CD that I'm offering. Luther believed in a future restoration of Israel under the coming of their Messiah. He did not believe God was finished with them. So everything that's been uh, attributed to Luther on the Jews and their lies is a lie. It's a Jesuit uh, creation as well as him being in a secret society. Luther was completely beholden to the Bible and therefore it didn't happen. And I recommend my, one of the books I have in my old book CDs, uh, Dowling's The History of Romanism. He has a very good section on Luther there. Okay, good, because I have that book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Cole, do you have another question? Uh, I do have a question, and it goes back to Israel and Palestine. Most people believe, including Desmond Tutu, uh, Bill Wion, I mean, I know that he's a Jesuit. He had been to South Africa. He was the main uh person for the church in South Africa, and he had been to Israel, and he said that the apartheid in Israel against Palestine is worse than the apartheid in South Africa. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. Um, first of all, as you said, Bishop Tutu was an agent of the Jesuit order, mm -hmm. and, and he was an Anglican bishop, for those listeners who might not know that. Um, Nelson Mandela is a Knight of Malta. Mm hmm Nelson Mandela's purpose is to kill all the whites out of South Africa. I have it on my website where he's singing about killing all the whites. My position on South Africa is South Africa should be divided, half of it given to the whites and half to the blacks, because I believe in racial separation of peoples, because God created the races to keep mankind separate, that we would not unite against him as we did before the flood when there was only one race, one language, and one landmass. So that's how I believe South Africa should be handled. In fact, it ought to be handed back to the Boers 
that it was stolen from in the first place. And also you want to remember this, that the blacks in South Africa have had the highest standard of living than any African nation. They came to South Africa. South Africa was uninhabitable when it was first settled by the Boers. It was too cold. So it's their land, and there would be no South Africa. There would have been no Transvaal or Orange Free State had not there been the, Je the Vatican's Inquisition in Europe driving those Dutch Protestants out of Europe into South Africa where there were no blacks. So that's how I would handle South Africa. Half should be given to the blacks, half should be given to the white people because 24,000 white people have been murdered by blacks since 1994. That's not right, and yet that's never talked about in the press. Next thing with regard to Israel, I believe that the best, thing, the best way to resolve that problem is there is no historic Palestinian people in Israel. That is not true. Most of them came there after the formation or just prior to the formation of Israel. And furthermore, if the Turks still held that land and the, Pal and the Arabs there were calling for their own state, the Turks would kill them all. So what I advocate for Israel is this, that the Arabs should be peaceably removed to Jordan, to Syria, to Lebanon, to Saudi Arabia, to any of the, the, the Arab states there, that they each should be given $10,000, and then they can be easily removed. The Jews can have their own land, as was promised to them. They can go back there. Jerusalem can be their capital. I believe in racial separation for peoples, and that's, the, that's one of the very few ways that you can bring about peace between peoples. They have to have their own nation, their own language, their own race, and their own culture in which they identify with. Fair enough. Fair that's enough. that's why that's why I advocate I advocate that Pennsylvania secede, and that a portion of Pennsylvania be given to the white people, and that a portion of Pennsylvania be given to the blacks, so the blacks can have their own nation. We whites can have our own nation, and I don't mean just any whites. I want to have a white Protestant and Baptist nation out of Pennsylvania, so the Catholics they can have their own section, the white Protestants we can have ours and Baptists, and the blacks they can have theirs, and then we can engage in trade with one another while at the same time provide the freedom of choice as to where we want to live. Self-government, basically. That's right, and this is absolutely doable. Because if they can spend billions and trillions of dollars in a no-win war in Iraq, they can surely rearrange this place here to the benefit of the peoples who live here. So I guess my last question would be, can you give the people some viable solutions to fight back against not only what's coming, but what's already here? Yes. Well, the first thing I, I always do is I bring people to the Bible and I show that God has commanded all men, men everywhere to repent and to believe the gospel, that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again, and he's coming back. And as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So once you're saved and you are now indwelt by the Spirit of God, you now have power over the devil and his Vatican and his Jesuits and his secret societies. Now you can begin to pray and truly seek the Lord, and he will begin to move for you. You are on God's side now because no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what Christ said. So now, once that happens, now we can begin to seek the Lord and do those things which we ought to do, like refuse to go to Iraq, like refuse to go to any foreign soil and fight in any foreign crusade, like refuse to pay the Pope's income tax because the vast majority of American people don't own it anyway. They're not in any privilege from Washington, therefore they're not subject to the Internal Revenue Code, which has been put upon us to finance these crusades. What we need to do is, is, uh, is every one of us needs to get armed. We need to have a carry, concealed carry permit. We need to, be able to take a course in the proper use of a firearm so that when these criminal element begins to rape, kill, and plunder us, regardless of what their race is, we can defend ourselves. While at the same time, our foreign invaders that are planning our invasion will know that if we're going to take down America, we just don't have to take down its military. We've got to take down its entire citizenry because they're armed. And that was one of the fears that the Japanese had. So I would say that those common things we need to do and, and also advocate secession of our state. It's time that we secede. We have no say in our government in Washington, and we have very little say in our state, so it's time to secede, and we can put things in order on our state level once we break away from Rome on the Potomac. 
And that's, a, and that's our Tenth Amendment right, states' rights that's in the right. Constitution. That's right. And even though the Supreme Court said in Brown, White versus, what was White versus Texas, I believe, in uh, 1869, that, that Texas versus White, in 1869, that no state can secede. I don't care what they've said. The, the Constitution says, or the law says, the intent of the lawmakers is the law. And the intent right. of the lawmakers was that the states can secede whenever they want to. And I show in my book that three states reserved the right to resume the powers that they delegated at the time they ratified the Constitution. And that was two northern states and one southern state. Virginia, Rhode Island, and New York. So just because this country, what was once a federal Calvinist republic, has been converted into an empire by the 14th Amendment, most people don't know what the 14th Amendment did. So no, we're going to continue to call for secession. We can create our own nation, and then we will resolve our own domestic policies while at the same time arming ourselves in preparation for our invasion because the Jesuits are going to call an army against us for our invasion. So then you believe the revolution is our only way out? Well, I believe faith in Christ, number one. Number two, secession. Secession is, is not really armed revolution. It's exercising your right to your state government to resume the powers that you delegated. And now, whatever state you might be in, for me it's Pennsylvania. We're now a sovereign nation. If there can be a Haiti, there can be a Pennsylvania. There can be a Dominican Republic or an Israel or a Jordan. There can be a Pennsylvania. So we become a sovereign nation once again and be self-governing. But we have to remember, as soon as we break the temporal power of the Pope, as soon as Washington no longer controls us, the Jesuits with their secret societies in your state are going to use their agents to try to implement the same tyranny that we broke away from. So we have to do things like completely abolishing secret societies. They cannot be allowed to exist in your country. Everything they do is evil because they do it in secret and in the darkness of their own lodge rooms or whatever you, they're going to use. So we can't I, tolerate that. Right? I completely agree, Eric. So we have to have nationalism. We have to have a culture once again, and we have to have a people that is distinguished by its race, by its language, and its culture, however small that nation might be, so we can have a national identity once again, and then being civil to one another, engage in trade with one another, so that we might benefit from the other cultures and the other peoples while at the same time maintaining our distinctions. Eric, I got one question left. Um, I heard an interview of yours and could have sworn it sounded like you believe that the sun revolves around the earth. Did I hear that right? That's correct. I'm a geocentrist. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that to me a little bit? Sure. In Psalm 19, it teaches that the sun revolves around the earth. Um, there, and, of course, there's a few very good books written on it, like The Earth is Not Moving by Marshall Hall and a couple other geocentric books on it where, for example, the Mickelson and Morley experiment back in the late 1800s showed that the Earth was at rest and that the sun moved. There were five major experiments conducted to prove that. Well, the Jesuits don't want you to know that because, you see, that's one of their secrets for nuclear detonations. There's no such thing as airborne nuclear war. All nuclear weapons have to be detonated on the ground. They have to be placed in a position. And that particular weapon has to be in a certain harmonic relationship with the sun as it's moving across the sky, wherever it might be in, in this particular Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, Equator area, whatever, so that it can trigger that device. Once you understand geocentricity, that is one of the keys for detonating a nuclear device. And they don't want you to know that. See, I don't believe anything that NASA tells me or anybody Absolutely. else. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just a continuation of Nazism. Did we ever go to the moon? No. Never. All a lie. And Anthony Hilder did a good job with that in one of his videos. I think it's the greatest lie ever sold, where he actually has footage of... Armstrong, you know, jumping out on the on the uh, surface of the moon, and a prop falls down, a light falls down, and he says, "Well, I guess we have to shoot this again." <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah. My last question for you, Eric, is: uh, Was there a Jesuit connection with Nikola Tesla? Yes. Nikola Tesla was as I have been able to find about him, an honest man. He was a Serb, you know, an Orthodox mm -hmm. Serb. 
right. came to came to America and conducted all of his experiments, but he didn't know that he was working for the Jesuits when he was working for J.P. Morgan, because J.P. Morgan was the Jesuit banker of his day. And when he was betrayed and when his tower was destroyed in New York, when he could draw all this energy and light whole cities with no wiring, and J.P. Morgan said, well, we can't charge anybody for this, then he realized he'd been had. So he then began to resist, and ultimately they stole all of his designs they killed him, I believe, in 1943. J. Edgar Hoover knew all about it. So he was another sacrifice that the Jesuits carried out because they did not want this technology that was set forth in a historic white Anglo-Saxon Protestant country that still had freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press, which means freedom of inquiry, freedom of scientific inquiry. So they took everything he had and they used it for their secret technologies to rule over us, to keep us in the dark ages, to keep us driving these disgusting internal combustion engines when we can all be using electromagnetic motors or straight water separating the hydrogen from the oxygen. And so they've kept us down in our technology, and Nikola Tesla is a casualty of that. Are there That's UFOs there? Pardon? Are there, are there uh, aliens that fly UFOs? No. I no, I do not believe in the alien agenda. What I do believe in is that there are, in fact, devils or demons that fly around in the atmosphere. But the crafts that are being flown are anti -gravity, flown Anti-gravity, right? They're anti-gravity. Oh, yes, they've perfected anti-gravity for many years. Mm -hmm. and, and the whole Roswell incident was a distraction where they, I believe they deliberately crashed that device, and they had these poor little men that were a result of genetic experiments by the Jesuits, similar to what they would do in cloning Adolf Hitler, like the boys from Brazil. And so they had these poor little men that they killed in this craft that they were probably flying remotely to then create the scare of our alien foreign outer space invasion that dominated the 50s and the 60s. So no, they have perfected anti-gravity. They have also perfected... Uh, uh, Crossbreeding to 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 make these different kinds of men they're 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 neutral you know they can't reproduce um, but they have done some horrible things uh, with the race at Area 51 and now another area in southern Nevada. Now I understand that a lot of these um, people involved in the occult believe in specific days of the year that are special to them and these imaginary lines that are connected, I forgot the correct term for them, such as uh, Boston and D.C. and, and um, other cities, they all are imaginary line that connect with like Stonehenge. Do you believe that there's some sort of spiritual connection to what they, what these people do? For their yes, emotions? I do. Oh, yes, because the devil, according to First and Second Corinthians 4.4, 4, the devil is the god of this world. So, therefore, as he orchestrates his kingdom here on earth, he's going to have his cities in certain occultic uh, patterns. I don't think they started out that way, especially in historic Protestant nations when the Protestants were fleeing Europe, but he made them that way. He brought them around to be that way. So I have no doubt that he has his occult design for the location of cities in the administering of his empire and all the major cities for the most part in the world capital cities and the big banking systems are all disgraced with these obelisks yeah. so that's another part of his his uh, all looking forward to Horus, looking forward to the man, it's phallic. So the coming risen Horus, all the cities must be looking forward to this, which will be the final pope killed and come back to life. And incidences like uh, Waco, where people are burned, would that be like a ritual right. sacrifice? Why, of course, sure. There was no need for that. Right. It was carried out by the great occult, uh, occultist Bill Clinton. Yes, it was. Huh? Yeah. Yes, it was. All right, any more questions, Colt? before we close? No, I think every question I had has been satisfied. I'm good. Okay. This, is, this is very uh, informative. Eric, do you want to share before we close? Sure. Um, you, you can check my website at uh, www.vaticanassassins.org. 
I have my CD for sale, which is 40 Federal Reserve notes plus five for shipping, and 325 Federal Reserve notes for the book plus shipping. Then I have my CONCON CD that I added over 100 pictures to. That's available for 20 plus shipping. And then I have my newsletter that is the first real issue is coming out this August, and it's going to be uh, six times a year. It's bi-monthly, and that's for 40 a year. So between the book and the, the, the um, CONCON display, uh, that will give you your backup, and then the newsletter will continue to build on what they're doing now to keep you apprised of of what they're up to, and I have some really great uh, guest writers for me, too. Eric, can you explain your slideshow presentation before we close? Sure. Um, I begin with asking, I show that, first of all, these important men have said that there's a conspiracy so massive that, you know, it boggles your mind. Hoover said it and a few others. Um, I then go into who is the Pope. I then go into showing that the Pope, understanding the papacy, you have to go back to Mystery Babylon religion. So in explaining Mystery Babylon religion, I show that it has a beginning with Nimrod in Babylon. It then, uh, the myth of the uh, Nimrod dying and coming back to life through Semiramis as Tammuz. That myth carries over into Egypt, excuse me, of Osiris dying. He comes back to life through Isis and the person of Horus. And this is the satanic myth originating in Babylon that is now centered in, excuse me, in Rome, where there's a, a pope who is holding the place of Horus, but he's not Horus yet. He's not the risen pope yet. Um, so I get into the mystery of Babylon religion. I get into Christmas. I get into the globe. I get into the triangle. I get into the all-seeing eye. I show you the use of the pyramid, the great pyramids in Egypt. One is Osiris. One is Isis. One is Horus. The small period is Horus. Off, off the off Isis, the the middle period, the middle, middle pyramid, which has a name I can't think of right now. You have the Sphinx. So out of the female comes the God Man, comes the Man Beast. And so the Egyptians were looking for that as personified in Pharaoh. The papacy is looking for that personified in the Pope. So I get into that mystery Babylon religion, and then once, the, once you understand that, then I go into the building of the papacy, how Constantine created Roman Catholicism in 725 with the Council of Nicaea, that he has nothing to do with biblical Christianity, that he created Romanism. And then I go from there to show the first man that was called the Pope, and then the Pope that got spiritual power was given spiritual power by Focus, and then the Pope that was given temporal power by Pepin, and then how Charlemagne was used by the Pope to implement his, the beginning of his Holy Roman Empire. And I bring that on through, and I just kind of jump ahead sometimes and show you how the papacy is ruling uh, America as its modern day Holy Roman Empire, and show the Pope there in Washington before the obelisk. I show the White House with the West Wing uh, designed for the purpose of the Jesuits. I show that the Oval Office is the vaginal Oval Office of the Virgin Mary, so that they can all meet there and with the blessing of the Virgin Mary and the Jesuits of Georgetown implement their domestic and foreign policies. So I carry that through somewhat, then I go to the history of the Inquisition. I show the Jesuits carried that out for 600 years, and then I show the modern day inquisition of fascism and communism, especially in Russia, uh, where the Jesuits controlled the Lubyanka and did all their torturing there with uh, Father Braun and Father uh, Walter Sizek, who was an American Jesuit there in Russia for many years, carrying out the inquisition in the Gulag. Uh, then I go from uh, the inquisition, then I go to the... Uh, the breaking of the Pope's power beginning to lose. I also show the papacy creating Islam, its usage for Islam. I have maps that are very intriguing. And then I show how the papacy used Islam to overthrow the Byzantine Empire. And then you have the starting of the Orthodox Church in 1054. And thus Rome declares war against that, carries out a crusade against it. So I show, as, I show the papacy, Islam, all that working together, the Orthodox Church, bringing it into the Protestant Reformation. Then I deal with several slides on Luther, what he believed about the Bible, what he believed about the papacy. I show you how, what he uh, believed about the Jews, as I mentioned previously, their future restoration, how he did not write on the Jews and their lies. And uh, then I go from the Reformation to the Counter-Reformation to the Jesuit order. And then that's where that gets interesting. I give uh, several slides on that on Ignatius. And then I show how the Jesuits founded Bohemian Grove. 
I show the, 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 the priests worshiping in Bohemian Grove in 1927 because Bohemian Grove is only 70 miles north of the Jesuit San Francisco University. Um, and then, then the Bohemia, the Jespin, one of the Jesuits' favorite terms, how John Napolmuk, who is the priest of Bohemian Grove, he's loved by the Jesuits because he was killed, because he wouldn't divulge the secrets of the confessional. So I, I kind of tie all these things in with a counter-reformation, and then I bring it up to present day, the creation of the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem for the papacy, the post-Masonic Jewish Zionists, the control of the Saudi Arabians, the control of other Islamic leaders after World War I, when, when the Jesuits in control of Britain divided up the Ottoman Empire for their benefit, and any, any true Muslim leader like King Faisal, who would resist the power of the Jesuit order, would be murdered. Um, I show the Jesuits were expelled from Iraq in 1969, which then they brought Saddam Hussein to power to mass murder the Shiites there and continue the mass murder. So there are, there are several different topics, and then as I bring it into the close, I show how the Jesuits were behind 9-11, how Bush gives Tenet the uh, American Medal of Freedom. I have the picture where he's putting it on, George J. Tenet. I show Cardinal Egan and George Bush. And I show St. Patrick's Cathedral, the palace of the archbishop where he rules the empire from. And then I ended up uh, with the gospel and call them into salvation in Christ. Excellent. And the slideshow, you said that to me on a side conversation that you're um, having people purchase that from you, be trained, and be able to present that in other areas? Yes. When, when they purchase the slideshow, it's pretty well self-explanatory. And uh, then they can give that presentation themselves to other people. So they, can be, so they can become an authority on that topic right there because it's all laid out and it's easily accessible and provable. And that's key for people to uh, duplicate this information and allow other people to uh, be informed. Absolutely. See, then it's, it's not expensive. It's only 20 bucks. But then you can give your presentation, and if others want to do the same thing, they can get it too. And so it'll just spread everywhere to see exactly how the Jesuits rule the West. They rule the Islamic world. They rule the Orthodox world. They run the Buddhist world. They're, they're coordinating this crusade all together. So whatever happens is designed that way. And so it's not a riddle to us why Schwarzkopf doesn't get rid of Saddam Hussein or something that simple, you know, that a a guy with a kindergarten education would do if he was a military leader. So as we see all these agents working together, we know who controls it, and we know what their end game is. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Cole, Phenomenal. Uh, pleasure to be with you, gentlemen. All right, Eric. Uh, God bless you. God bless uh, everybody. Uh, good night, and um, we'll see you again next Thursday. Okay, hey, Mr. Phelps, i got to say it's been, it's been an honor. You're a patriot. A gentleman and a scholar, and I can't wait for you to be on the show again. I hope you'll come on the show again. Well, I'd be happy to, sure. <laughs> and I'd love to talk a little bit further about you, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, too. Sure, that would be great. Sure, I'd love to. All right, Eric. Assalamu alaikum. God bless you, man. Okay, Lord bless you, too, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Good night. One love.